Hello, it's Ian Gregg here with another episode of the Living Word podcast, which is anchored in the Bible readings set for Sunday, August the 13th, in the interdenominational scheme that many different churches and chapels use. And this week is all about faith and the security we find in having a faith relationship with God, which comes through our believing, trusting and receiving Jesus Christ as Lord of our lives. Faith can be used in the sense of different faiths and religions, but while focusing on the kind of faith that Jesus spoke about, and sometimes gently tells us off if we are found weak in it. He loves us and wants us to love him and trust him. And that's not religion, it's a relationship. So it's not about mumbo jumbo or amateur dramatics, costumes or titles. It's not about the rules and rituals of religions. There are plenty of other places to get that. We are all about Jesus and the relationship with Almighty God, knowing him personally, that he and only he gives us the relationship that opens us up to seeing things from his higher perspective, which often challenges our more limited view. That's what faith does. That's why we find such security in knowing God, because it's knowing that we are always held secure in his grip. So let's get into it. God sees things differently, and at times he needs to grab us and show us his perspective. Here are three examples from the Bible. Joseph's bullying brothers capture him, throw him into a pit, and then sell him as a slave to traders. Through this rejection, he experiences God holding him. Next, we see Jesus calling Peter out of the boat to come to him on the water. He starts in faith. But taking his eyes off Jesus for a moment, faith and he both sink, and Jesus catches him. Faith takes practice, but Jesus is there when we stumble. Today, God grabs us spiritually through hearing his word. But how do we receive it? By declaring publicly who Jesus is and how he is Lord of our life. Three ways God grabs us. Three ways we grow spiritually. One way to know God personally through Jesus. Let's take a deeper dive into this story about faith, about resolving to align ourselves with God's perspective beyond what we see and feel. Well, that's one way of explaining it, and it might be a good start to spend a few more moments trying to define what biblical faith is. The Bible talks about hope, and it talks about faith, and the two are similar, which is confusing. The distinction is that hope is general, and faith is specific. Hope is a confident expectation in the goodness of God. It is believing him to be true to his character, and therefore believing him for the outcome that he is seeking to be the best one for us, at least in the long term. So hope trusts in God in a general way. Faith builds on that confidence in God based on a specific word, or impression that God has given us. If we are praying that God will be true to his character towards us, we put ourselves in a good place to hear something specific about that general prayer, something God is challenging us to believe and act on before we actually see it. God gives us specific reasons to exercise faith, and as we will see, it's something which takes practice, something which is grown in us as we trust God in difficult circumstances. So the pathway to having a strong faith in God is plenty of failures along the way. Failures in which we have experienced his goodness and forgiveness and have learnt by it. When we go through our precarious life with hope in God and build on that with the faith that comes by hearing, as we listen to him, we walk a pathway of faith with him. That is our true security, whatever the world throws at us, which can at times be shocking, difficult, and even cruel. This is how it was for Joseph, our first example in Genesis 37. It started with a word from his father, Jacob. So, not a word from God directly, but because Joseph's destiny is bound up with this instruction, we can view it as an indirect word of divine origin. From the Bible we read. Israel said to Joseph, As you know, 
Your brothers are grazing the flocks near Shechem. Come, I am going to send you to them. Very well, he replied. So he said to him, Go and see if all is well with your brothers and with the flocks, and bring word back to me. Joseph walked for miles before finding his brothers, and then he was not welcomed. They tore his coat off, pushed him into the pit of a dried-up system, and debated whether to kill him or get rid of him another way. The Bible again. Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Just then, a plodding camel caravan came into sight, and as it drew near, the brothers greeted the Midianite traders who were on their way across the desert to Egypt, laden with spices and valuables to sell there. Egypt's economy depended on having plenty of slaves to do the work, and the source of these slaves was mainly Canaan and Mesopotamia. And so it was an easy thing for the evil brothers to sell Joseph to the traders for the going rate. Read again. So when the Midianite merchants came by, his brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for 20 shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took him to Egypt. So, where is faith in this story? We know that Joseph was righteous and obedient, and so we can take from this that he has an expectation that God was looking after him, even in such a terrible situation of cruelty and rejection. The word was from his father Jacob, sending him to bring back a report on the other sons and their flocks. Given their historic hostility to Joseph, it was an assignment that was never going to go well. But he did exactly what he had been told, with the understanding that this was in God's will. The unfolding story of Joseph and the whole tribe of Israelites joining him in Egypt, Genesis 39-47, to shows how this works out. He was a man who had an especially close walk with God, and faith that grew through further trials. But God's hand was on him, and he was used in a great way, altering the destiny of his whole tribe and also for the nation of Egypt by averting a terrible famine. While learning how a relationship with God by faith gives us the security of knowing we are in his grip. And our next illustration of this is Peter being called by Jesus to come to him by walking on a wind-blown stormy sea. Peter hears Jesus call him, and in faith he gets out of the boat and makes a good start. We often view Peter as impetuous and someone who makes mistakes, fairly serious ones. But his star quality has been learning by them, and despite his failings, the Lord chose him to be the leader of the disciples in the early church following the resurrection. And that, as the story in Acts tells us, called for a high level of faith and determination, qualities which Peter, through his various trials, had grown in. We said that the difference between hope, trusting in a general expectation of God, and faith as believing something specific, is about a word received. And Peter receives a word very directly from Jesus, who simply says to him, Come. Reading from the Bible. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and, beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. 
You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. What we tend to remember from this story is the part where we read, When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. While inclined to overlook how Peter did something that goes far beyond what most of us have been asked to do. Not an able swimmer, he got out of a small boat in a rough sea and set out to do what they had seen our master doing. So let's not overlook the part of the story where Jesus says, Come, then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came towards Jesus. The other important aspect of this story, which has application for us, is that Peter's faith did fail, and he did begin to sink, and he was genuinely frightened as he cried out for the Lord to save him. But immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. This tells us that when we step out in faith, in a small way or in a greater way as Peter did, the Lord is with us, the Lord is near, and the Lord will catch us if we fail. So there is a risk involved in listening to the Lord and attempting to do what he puts in front of us. But there is also safety in that risk because we don't do it on our own. Jesus knows all about our weakness and our fallibility and he is there to catch us just as he was there to catch Peter. And was Peter branded a failure? Well, he was chided for his lack of faith, and we can be sure that for Peter, under the tutelage of his master, this was a big learning experience which stood him in very good stead later on. The story of Joseph can seem rather detached from the life that we lead, and even Peter's experience in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Similarly, it's quite a long way from the reality of our lives, so how does it help us? If we were in doubt about this, the next segment of the story addresses us right where we are, and it contains some very important teaching about saving faith, how we receive it, and also express it to others. Faith has a certainty about it because we have heard from God, and if that is the case, we have a confidence in telling others about it. Faith expresses itself readily. And Paul brings a vital teaching here. Telling others is a key to our establishing the faith that brings us salvation and the assurance of being in right standing with God, which comes by hearing the word of God. It is as we express that to others that the deep transformation takes place in our hearts. Old-time preachers used to talk about the journey of faith from head to heart, being the short distance that can be the longest journey. This describes a vital, essential process in which faith has to have been formed more than just as a mental ascent about who Jesus is and what he has done. We can say all the right words and join in with all the prayers and yet not have that sense of being his in our hearts. So let's hear an excerpt of this passage in Romans 10 now. But the righteousness that is by faith says, The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. What is church all about? It is an avenue for people to find out about Jesus, to become convicted about who he is, and to become Christians. Some, of course, become Christians without any church involvement, simply by reading the Bible or by a friend patiently sharing with them the story about their own journey of faith to tell the truth about who Jesus is. 
And increasingly these days, people will find Jesus through an Alpha course. Or it could be the more traditional means of attending a church where the gospel is faithfully preached, and after a while God's word becomes living and real for them and settles in their hearts. But bear in mind, 97 of people do not now attend church, so other gateways like Alpha, Friendship and social media have greatly grown in significance. However, some churches, often the ones of greater formality, are putting an emphasis on all sorts of other things, including an elaboration of the fellowship in the presence of the Lord around the bread and wine, turning it into a religion all of its own, but not one that transforms. No one becomes a Christian that way. It's a distraction and one to be aware of and to avoid. Whether it's the sharing of a friend, or the preaching of an anointed minister, or the reality of the Alpha discussion, God's Word, the Bible record, is foundational, not least because he continues to speak through it. And we do well to remember that if church is meaningful, it is about Jesus and his mission. That constrains us against becoming a club of like-minded people. It puts the focus back on our being a vehicle which makes it easy for people to find Jesus and invite him into their own hearts. We've already touched on the danger of mental ascent, a kind of intellectual knowledge about God and Jesus which never quite gets to the point of personally receiving him. This is why Paul writes with such emphasis, for it is with your heart you believe and are justified and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Becoming a Christian is such a life-changing event, such a relief and joy and transformation, that the person who has had that experience can hardly not tell others about it. But there is an important confirmation that happens in our telling others, because that declaration establishes the faith transaction that has taken place. It's a no-going-back statement of our trust in God, and not just that Jesus is Lord, but that Jesus is Lord of our life and everything in it. And that is when we have the assurance of his salvation, not only at the end time, but in all the fears and uncertainties of life. It is simply knowing that, having received and responded to his love, we are always held secure in his grip. Let me share a prayer with you. Lord, like those first disciples, we ask, increase our faith while heeding your instruction to exercise and grow the faith we have. Help us to learn from Peter by keeping our focus on you and protect us from a presumed devotion that attempts to gain merit. We are so grateful for you Jesus, and what you have done for us, and we know that we cannot add to it. Amen. Well, that's about it for this week. I hope this has encouraged you. May God bless you and be close to you as you listen for his voice and grow in faith. Bye for now. See you on the next one.